We started this podcast actually because we wanted to write a book. We were pissed off opening the pages of best-selling business books to find that the companies referenced were Silicon Valley tech unicorns. Their texts are often entertaining, but they've got nothing to do with the world I live in, and I suspect it's the same for you today too. Now, we are going to write that book, and today's episode is probably going to have a chapter all of its own, because today's show is a masterclass in value innovation, also known as Blue Ocean Strategy. Now, if you're listening to this while you're doing something else that needs attention, like using power tools, I suggest you hit stop and listen to ABBA instead of this podcast, because this is an episode that is really going to claim your attention. Today, we're joined by JetBlue's General Manager for Europe, Maya Gedesef, and she is going to take us through JetBlue's incredible and inspiring story of growth, innovation, disruption, and purpose. Maya gives you a true window into the soul and ethos of the company and its ideals. She's extremely detailed about the decisions JetBlue makes, and if you're as curious as hungry for insight as me, oh my God. God, you're in for a real treat. Now, while researching this show, I noted that JetBlue had managed to achieve both price leadership and clear differentiation. According to traditional texts on strategy, that's kind of not possible. It's binary. You either choose price leadership or you choose differentiation, but you can't have both. Except as it turns out, you can. And others have achieved it too. Think Citizen M Hotels, Tesla, Yellowtail Wine, Nintendo Wii, HubSpot, Caterpillar, Salesforce, and many more. Now, these companies have all executed what INSEAD professors Chan Kim and René Mauborn dubbed a Blue Ocean strategy, and they did it whether they meant to or not. JetBlue has also created a clear market space that it owns. Its own Blue Ocean, if you like. Now, if you haven't come across Blue Ocean strategy before, I'm going to link some references in the show notes. Kim and Moborn's work may give you ideas too, which after all is what this show is all about. And today we're going to ask Maya to frame her story around the four P's of marketing, product, price, promotion and place. And we're going to break that into two parts because there's so much to cover. But first, let me tell you a little bit about JetBlue the business. It was founded in 2000 with a mission to bring back humanity to air travel. And you're going to hear a lot about that. Today, JetBlue is New York's hometown airline carrying 44 million passengers, which, by the way, is as many as British Airways. With over 900 daily flights, serving around 100 destinations in the USA, Caribbean, South America, and now the continent of Europe, JetBlue has made its name for affordable fares and high-quality customer service. And it's that ability to innovate on both value and service that I wanted to explore with Maya. So, Maya, welcome to the Unicorny Project. I mentioned in the introduction that it looks like JetBlue has executed the most extraordinary blue ocean strategy. Is that a phrase or something that you recognise? I mean, how do you talk about this innovation at JetBlue? It's really interesting. First of all, I've been with JetBlue now. This is my fourth year. And honestly, you know, I have to look back to where we began in 2000. And the airline already then was set up to disrupt the market. We wanted to bring something new, fresh, innovative. We wanted to bring humanity back to travel because by 2000, everything in travel was about quick processing. So it was missing the the personal touch. It was missing the emotion the experience. It was all about the seat, who is in the seat, sales and so on. We came into the market and we wanted to disrupt by doing something very different. We introduced Mint product. Uh, We were the first airline to introduce completely free Wi-Fi that actually works. And um, also, you know, we are now, you know, crossing the pond. So this is really a big deal for us with a product that's very different and you know, still we didn't compromise on the value of that product for the price that we charge. And there we have value innovation defined perfectly. It's price or value leadership without having to compromise on quality. Until relatively recently, that went against business strategy orthodoxy. That's correct. When you communicate your approach internally to your own team, 
How does the the way that you're organized, like your organizational design and your internal communication mechanics, how does that work? Is that different than in other companies too? Like does your, do the internal culture reflect what you're trying to do outside? I mean, we're 23 years old now and over time, you know, our values have not changed and we all have learned to live those values. And, you know, and one of the values actually is fun values. So we make sure that we always have fun in whatever we do. But of course, safety, caring, passion. These are the things that define JetBlue. And uh, it's funny, we're talking just now about acquisition of another airline in the US called Spirit. And we're in the process of sort of thinking about how are we going to end up after this acquisition is complete and how our culture will change. Yeah. Because there are certain things that Spirit will bring along, their you know culture, their ways of doing things that will benefit our new company that will emerge. But we still want to make sure that we preserve those things that made us so successful. The core ethos, yeah. Yes. Now I get it. No matter what you do, yeah. you're a crew member of JetBlue. And, you know, crew members of JetBlue uh, tend to stick a long time. Okay. We still have among our most inspirational leaders, founders that started back uh, in 2000 right. or actually even before the planes were there in, in 1999, you know, some joined. We didn't have the planes yet at that point. So it's that culture that that kind of keeps us going. Brilliant. Okay. Well, look, I think that gives us a context for what we're about to talk. And we're going to dive very deep, I hope, into the business. What struck me in when we held our pre-production meeting for today was how deep the desire is to disrupt. And, and I think the word's already been said five or six times. It's right in your DNA and you seem to want to rewrite all the rules for everything. And I think, I hope that's going to come out. So I want to dig deeper into the concept of value innovation. And I think given this is a marketing show, we're going to use the four P's as a framework. So let's get stuck in and talk about product. And I want to start with the big bits. Okay. So you've created a unique and differentiated product. It really stands out in the airline industry. Even your airplanes are different. Correct. So when we said we were going to fly transatlantic, we said, okay, we want to set up a product that's going to be new, fresh, different, and it's going to be definitely more competitive and we will be able to basically, you know, compete with the big legacy carriers on transatlantic market. Entering transatlantic market is like entering a lion's den. It's been uh, for a long time um, sort of monopolized by big carriers that have been operating these routes for decades at very high prices. So what we did, we we invested a lot of time, I believe four to five years that our product team invested in sort of understanding, first of all, the con customer and transatlantic market. And uh, then we took all that information and data and we went back to to the drawing board and, and started thinking about, you know, what are the little things that will be different on board our flights? So first of all, we don't have the wide body aircraft. We have a narrow body aircraft with a single aisle. And that makes a huge difference because the whole service element becomes more personal yeah. and the feeling on board becomes more unique. Like you're in a private jet. Oh, totally. It's a <laughs> private jet feeling. It's a private jet feeling. You board and deboard these flights very quickly. And the idea is that the crew members on board have actually time to dedicate and devote themselves fully to the customer experience. And it's not just for the business class, which we call Mint experience. It's also for the economy class product, which we call the core experience. So already there, we changed the names of these cabins because we didn't want them to be called business and economy because actually they're more than economy and they're very different than just for a business customer. They're actually address the needs of high-end leisure customers as well, or any other customer that wants to fly on these flights. In the front of the cabin, we said we had mint experience. So we have about 24 seats. All seats have both aisle and window access. They have basically a sliding door so that you can close and cocoon yourself into your own private room on board. There is also like a loungy kind of feeling. So they're very warm colors, wood, etc. cetera. Um, we played with light in the cabin as well. So what we did, we, we were the first airline to innovate with Airbus, this airspace cabin that we have now also on the narrow body aircraft. Usually you would see that or find it on wide body aircraft, but we were the first airline to have it on narrow body aircraft. 
what does that mean? You have these mood lights, you have this spacious um, kind of feeling of the cabin that actually gives you the notion of flying on a wide body aircraft almost. And you have these mood lights that change throughout the flight, depending on the type of service we're offering at that moment or type of uh, or time of the day. So that customers can either, you know, enjoy the live flat bed or just sit down and have a cocktail or watch a movie. So it's that kind of thing. So that was one thing that we did. I just want to get back to the narrow bodied aircraft because developing an airframe takes years and years and years. Airbus was your partner in this. How responsive were they to developing something new, like totally new? I think they were also keen to put something in place that is going to really work. And to be honest, I think following our order of these aircraft, there were many other airlines that followed. A321, a long range Airbus aircraft is very much the aircraft of the current times. I mean, we live in the world of where sustainability is number one. The environmental impact is critical for corporates, but also for individuals. The millennials are coming along, you know, the young generations that are looking for the aircraft that's going to actually care for the environment. And this type of aircraft is actually re- answering all those questions. So I, I get that. They're working with you and you've, you've basically co-created a different type of space. The level of detail you described is extraordinary, but I guess you did your field work for four years. So you you know what the market wants. And I think for me, that's a defining characteristic of any kind of blue ocean strategy. You really know the customer well, and that's how you're able to carve out a completely different space, I think. 100%. I mean, we also thought about, you know, what happens when you're sitting in that seat, You know, it's like, how long are your arms? What can you reach? Do you need to really kneel down to get to your power outlet? Or can you just have a wireless charger next to your like left arm, for example, in our case. Can we play some uh, space on the side where you can put your bottles of water or you can put your laptop? How do we make a tray for the laptop accessible, but that you can also during the flight, just push it away and get your meal served? So let's come to that now. We're getting, we're getting inside the cabin a bit deeper because service is an important part of product. And you took, a, again, a very, very different approach through partnership with family-run, minority-run, female-run businesses that really, I mean, it makes the experience, I think, very different and appeals to customers, I think, who have an ESG agenda or or like the fact that you s- sort of support small businesses and diverse businesses. Isn't there a f- an amusing story with one of the partners about how you met them? Yes. So we're actually very much an airline that resembles our own customer base. And the way we wanted to innovate is we wanted to give an opportunity to diverse and different businesses, to to small businesses, to unusual businesses, to actually be able to serve bigger markets. I'm very <laughs> proud of this one story. You know, our CEO was traveling and and there was a lady sitting right next to him and she offered him a couple of cookies. He tried those. He's like, wow, these cookies are really fantastic. You know, where where'd you get them from? Who whose cookies are these? And which brand? And she's like, well, these are mine. You know, I produce them for a community, you know, a small community where, where I live in. And then he was, well, um, how about you produce these for 44 million <laughs> customer base of JetBlue? You can hear Maya's passion for product in all she says here. And you know, in the edit process, we were a bit worried it sounds a little salesy, but if you're looking to differentiate your product, there's so much to learn from an almost fanatical level of detail that JetBlue takes to its customer experience. They've literally reinvented everything to do with the experience. And you know, Maya hasn't finished detailing them yet either. From co-creating a new airline experience, from the airframe to the lighting in the cabin to really thinking through the ergonomics of the cabin space, to taking a value-led approach to supplier selection and building New York's eateries and design ethos into the heart of the brand, that's kind of more than creating distinctiveness. It's genuine differentiation. I think there are lessons we can all learn here about truly putting ourselves in our customers' shoes and taking a much more critical look at our products and services. Like if we all had the same attention to detail and explored literally every touch point to the same degree that JetBlue and Maya do, well, we too might be building ourselves a blue ocean. I don't know about you, but as I was writing this part of the overdub script, I promised to be inspired by Maya to think about our own product experience more. I know we can do more. 
and I hope her passion for product is having the same effect on you. Now, I love the story about the CEO and the cookie cook. Maya does too. She's really proud of it. But the food story, mm, it doesn't stop there. That is a great story because it just tells you that, you know, we would want to work with anyone. We want to give an opportunity. We want to give voice. We want to give a platform um, to those that really are eager and want to also work with us. And that's really appealing from a customer point of view as well, because that kind of gray rubber chicken that you you know, the chicken or beef option. Oh, you yeah. Get, no, don't, doesn't that's, exist. That's just <laughs> done with. And I love the fact that the service is kind of branded as well. It feels very different. But you must have a great procurement department as well, because I think it must be every procurement department's nightmare. The CEO meets someone and goes, we're going to have that. <laughs> At all sort of positions in our company, we're all open-minded to these things. We work with big, of course, big suppliers and big partners, but we also love to have these small businesses. We have another example for, uh, you know, just, just to mention that one. We serve now plantain chips on board our flights okay. as well. And that is sourced from the Caribbean partner, you know, and this is something that really also stands out. You know, we're bringing those regions where we fly to also to the vast customer base that we have in the North American market and even the transatlantic market now. So these plantain chips are coming from the Caribbean, but they're That's reaching fantastic. our London customer. And you don't even need to worry about food miles because you're flying anyway, right? That's right. Great. <laughs> so that's at the, at the smaller end, although it's not small for them anymore because they've gone from being like not quite mom and pop businesses, but now they're serving 44 million people. But you've also, you know, the service is different. Entertainment, you've taken a very different approach too. Definitely. So in terms of entertainment, we felt that we want to give our customers the ability to stay connected throughout their flight. We realize that being away from your technology or from your business or for a significant time could cause some kind of anxiety as well. And uh, to be honest, we were the first airline to introduce completely free Wi-Fi across all our cabins and, and the entire network. And actually that Wi-Fi works. You can even stream your favorite movies and anything else that you like, but stay connected to your business and, you know, get off a flight with a kind of free mind, you know, relaxed and knowing that you've done what you needed to do and you can get on with your day. It's really important these days. I mean, at least for me, from my perspective, being a customer, that's one thing I would want to expect. But it's not just that. We also have live TV. Okay. You can never miss a Premier League game okay. with us. We okay. will stream your favorite shows and, you know, you'll see like news always okay. coming up and so on. So, yeah, this is another uh, upside of that. And, of course, the in-flight entertainment, the standard one where we introduce some really latest movies. People can basically bring their own entertainment. Yeah, so Netflix, Amazon, whatever they use. They Anything bring it they in. like, yes. Wow. Wow. Okay. So the key thing about, as I said, about value innovation is price leadership, but also a highly differentiated product. And normally differentiation costs more, but you've managed, I guess, by focusing on the things people care about and not doing the things they don't care about. Are there any sacrifices that you think you've made, like things that other people do that you don't feel the need to do? I'd say that perhaps I can see one thing from one and the other perspective in terms of being phenomenal for the customer, but has been a challenge to introduce ourselves. So in our economy cabin, which is the core experience, we again use technology to bring complete innovation to the way we serve food on board. And um, I love that. I think this is the biggest upside on any carrier right now. The fact that we fly the narrow body aircraft allows us to do something very different. And that is to allow the customer through the technology to pick and select how they want to build their own meal. And the crew then gets this order on a tablet and is able to put together a specific meal for you. And they will walk by and they will say, hey, Dom, you ordered this kale salad or, you know, sweet potatoes, or you had like uh, cauliflower rice with uh, chicken or meatballs that are very popular or or mac and cheese. So we definitely don't have any more um, chicken or beef. This is completely out for us. And what is in is actually giving the customer the ability to feel like they're in a fantastic restaurant with healthy food options. And if they're choosing, I guess you're reducing waste massively. That is right. It's been like almost two years now that we operate these flights. We understand now what customers love to have. 
the, the key base meal they want to yeah. stick with. We know exactly what are the sides they like, and this is what we cater for on board our flights. It's really a, a great and different way, and it's also giving a, an economy class customer an ability to feel a bit different and yeah. that their choice is valued and they can actually create their experience themselves. And there's so much behavioral economics in that because people always value things that they make themselves more than, yeah. So, 100%. Super smart. Okay, so look, we've done the big product. We've done the service on the inside. A core part of product is also, of course, in the travel industry destinations. Now, in the early days, you were point to point to uh, under-targeted destinations right out of the budget airline playbook. But now you've gone international. London, Paris, Amsterdam. That's right. Where next? Maybe south of Europe somewhere. Spain or Italy. Or am, I getting, be, am I getting warmer? Could be you're getting warmer. Yeah, okay. We went to find destinations that are available to our customer, to a huge customer base yeah. in New York and Boston, 365 days a year. And this is for us the key thing, actually, that we introduce not just the fantastic product and the low fare that we stand for, but we also give opportunity to our customers to actually continue to fly us on these transatlantic routes yeah, okay. instead of other airlines. So our biggest unserved markets up until recently were London, were um, Amsterdam and Paris. And then after that, I believe that south of Europe has become extremely attractive. Lisbon is probably one of the top destinations for the U.S. customers. And the same goes for Spain, Madrid or Barcelona. You know, those are kind of those like interesting great. markets. Yeah, very yes. Good. Yes. Lovely. Okay. But breaking into new markets is really hard, particularly in aviation, as you say, because those slots are very, very strongly guarded. And you decided to commit to the UK during COVID when the rest of the industry was shuttered or certainly timid. But the numbers must be enormous committing to a new route. Tell me the story of how you landed Heathrow. Very interesting story. And I love that story. I think it just shows how bold and brave we were. As you imagine, um, during the pandemic, aviation industry was hard hit by yeah. the entire events and the corridor was closed and transatlantic, especially between the US and the UK. Um, many airlines grounded their planes, etc. And we felt like we should you know, continue to look for opportunities and play offense a little bit. In fact, everyone then followed suit. So it looked like a little bit of a of a soccer match. Everybody was running around trying to score with the ball and, you know, find the opportunity to to win. And I think that we as a team, we said, all right, the key will be to enter Heathrow, which is yep. usually impossible to do. Yeah. That is the most expensive real estate in aviation when it comes to the airport slots. Yeah. We um, said, okay, let's have a look. Let's see what happens. Some of the slots were available and we managed to get them on an ad hoc basis. Okay. What does that mean? That means that you get it for a certain period of time. Usually it's a yata summer or winter season. And once that season expires, you are then waiting to, to hear whether you're getting it for the next season. Okay. And so on and so on. And we said, okay, you know, we definitely want to get in and we will show that we are committed, that we're invested and that we are here to stay. Okay. And we will use that period to actually show our key stakeholders, meaning the airport, of course, as number one, but also the authorities, and basically played the proper partner win-win game. Yep. And this is what we did. And we ended up having slots at Heathrow. Fantastic. Today we operate three flights at Heathrow. Okay, fab. I think that's product well done. Let's move on to price. JetBlue very clearly positioned as a lower cost alternative to the legacy carriers. And I've mentioned already that that lower cost plus differentiation or plus high quality is the blue ocean. How are you able to maintain the position? Because I'm imagining that you've got a pack of other people coming after you trying to innovate in the same sort of ways. Being a leader is hard. Like maintain that leadership position is hard. First of all, um, it is very important to understand that our philosophy overall throughout our entire network is to bring that value and the low fare. We are not always the lowest fare, yep. but we want to make sure that the customer, when they do pay the ticket, that they feel that they got the most out of it. Yep, okay. And this is our philosophy. Right. Now, we were looking at these transatlantic markets for quite a long time. Yep. And we observed that prices on transatlantic markets would 
go up to maybe for a business class seat on a six hour flight or a five and a half hour flight would go up to 10, 15,000 pounds on a return flight, yep. which is completely unacceptable in the world we live in right now. I mean, everybody is looking to get the most yeah. for the for the buck, but they're also looking to potentially save as much as they can, especially in the corporate world. Yeah. So we said, okay, we can we can change that. We don't have to have these margins. I mean, this there are margins that are involved here. Yeah. So we said, fine, we will create a product and an experience and we will charge accordingly. And what we entered the UK market with was actually 70% lower fares in in our business wow. class cabin, mint cabin, yep. than what the competition offered. The same goes in in our economy c- cabin, where we offered fantastic product and, and, and experience elements, but for about 20 to 30% lower okay. fares. So it's value leadership, not price leadership that matters to you. Correct. But it's nice if you have a a more attractive price. What happens in in the aviation world, it's the same like with hotels, et cetera, where you manage the inventory. So in our case, you know, we have 134 seats on board our flights. And at a certain point in time, when the flight starts becoming full, it will, the price will start yeah. getting higher. Yeah. In terms of lessons that our listeners can take away from this, I love the concept of value leadership. And because you've thought so deeply about the product and where there's value in the product, you can be confident that you're offering better value, if not always a better price. Okay, I've got my head around that. How do partners help you with your value leadership principles? You Probably we are good at selecting the right partners okay. at the right value as well. I won't say that we're looking to create the product cheap. We're creating a quality product, yep. but it's the partners that usually you won't find already being in the industry recognized okay. or used by other competitors. No gate gourmet here. Well, we have no, no, no. <laughs> By the way, on the food side, we did pick a really great partner. It's Do & Co. And okay. the, their chefs are trained by the restaurant chefs okay. that we use the recipes from. But I'll tell you the following. For our seat, for example, we used a bad mattress producer, which is a proper bad mattress producer. And they actually installed their bad mattresses on our seats. So you have actually a bed in the sky, a proper bed in the sky. And probably that company will not be the one that will be used by other partners. And we have the ability to feature them, to talk about the quality of their product. It gives us that value but maybe not at, you know, high cost. My only knowledge of mattresses is how expensive they are. So I can't imagine that an actual mattress seat might give you any price advantage over a seat seat, but I'll take your word for it, it does. One of the very frustrating things as a passenger with airlines and all the big carriers are doing it these days is they bait you with a low fare and then they pile on extras. What's your policy? Is the whole industry like that now? We have this uh, kind of concept of a, of, a, of a fare that includes you know, the, the base core product that yep. we call core product. And then you have the ancillaries. So in aviation, that is how we function. The ultra low cost or the low cost carriers will actually break the product down into pieces. Yes. And you will see that with them and they will sell seat this, the um, bag there, you know, refunds or changes this and yep. that. Yep. In our case, we have a full inclusive fare that gives you the full experience on board. So basically, you will be able to get the bag included. You'll get your seat. You will get your meal. You will get your free Wi-Fi, which is a huge add-on. We also, although a small airplane, like we mentioned earlier, a narrow-body aircraft, we stand for the airline that provides the biggest legroom space in economy as well on transatlantic. How do we do it? Well, we want to do that for our customers. And then on top of that, we offer free snacks and free soft drinks throughout the flight as well to all customers. So that is the basis for us. And then, you know, we we have the ability then to build on that in case customer says, well, I'd like to add another bag. Sure, you can buy that. Okay. Or I'd okay. like to upsell to an even more space, which yeah. is a seat which has more leg room. You yeah, can upsell okay. there. Okay. Or in our mint cabin, we have at the very front two studios that you can actually get. And uh, they're also an upsell. Those studios can actually host two people for lunch, meeting, or okay. wow. cocktail sharing, or <laughs> just movie watching. So differentiating in how you price the product too. But ultimately, at the heart of this is a low-cost business model. So you're innovating through partnerships. So Dom, I just want to correct this. It's not a low-cost. It's a low-fare value okay. carrier. Because because low cost, you, usually people have this perception when you say low cost. The point is, 
are your costs that you put into creating the product low or is your fare yes, low? Yes, and I meant the latter. Is, I meant yes. are the costs you're putting in. Yes, you're right. To have a value leadership, you have to keep a very keen eye on what you're spending. Exactly. As well as what you're charging, of course. Exactly. We make sure that our costs are efficiently managed. Yep. We make sure that what we put in has high value and that low cost. There are businesses out there that we partner with that have the same philosophy as we do. Okay. So we want to find like-minded partners that are maybe breaking into to another industry okay. that are thinking, wow, actually I'm making beds now, but tomorrow I could be making seats in the sky. Seats in the sky. Yeah, yeah. like Who why not? It, right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> why don't we just do that? Yeah. You know, like let's do it. Wow. You know, I think that's price done. By the way, if you're listening to this and you have any questions that you want us to address, you can record a voicemail for us by going to unicorny.co.uk and on the tab on the right-hand side of the screen, you can click on that and leave a voice message. Now, if you do that, I will heat-seek Maya and when she's not too busy, I will get those questions answered for you. And if your questions are really good, I might even read them out on air at one of our future episodes and see if she'll come back and answer them. But for now, today, that is it. In part two, we're going to move on to promotion and place. And believe me, the content is just as good. Now, if you've enjoyed this episode, there are loads more in our back catalogue and we're going to be publishing weekly now, as you know, so there's loads more to come. It takes us around 10 to 12 hours to make every 30-minute episode, so we do really hope you like the show. Be sure to follow us on your favourite pod platform and please connect to us on LinkedIn too. You can find my details on the show notes and connect to me there. And by the way, if you pop your email address in the box at unicorny.co.uk, we will let you know the minute a new show goes live. One last thing, really appreciate it if you would recommend the show to your colleagues, friends and network. Thanks for listening and we will see you next time for more amazing insights from JetBlue's Maya Giddesseff. <laughs>